I'm delighted on behalf of the um, campus, I guess is the fair way to put it, the Institute, and of course the Pater Symposium here to, to welcome you all to this uh, uh, symposium. The uh, Pater Sailor Symposium has been, as you may know, a wonderful institution that has been um, now, uh, I think we are now the fifth, tenth, my time flies when you're having fun, the uh, <laughs> symposium. Uh, and you may know that um, the name Sather is a very uh, large name on this campus. Anyone who enters the campus enters uh, through the Sather Gate. And that is uh, a legacy that we are delighted to have associated with these programs. My name is Richard Buxbaum. I'm on the uh, law faculty here and was uh, once also, as is Dean Leonard, now the Dean of International Area Studies, when we had these uh, programs. Uh, the uh, program this year, as you see, is on a relatively uh, current topic and at the same time a relatively hot topic, uh, given the situation in which uh, we and the United Nations um, find ourselves. Uh, failed states and rogue states, uh, what do we do about them? Do they exist? Uh, that is the theme, and I couldn't think of a more current and more uh, vital theme. The program will be that we will have two principal presentations, uh, both relatively short, even by Berkeley standards, which are shorter than the, than the international standards, I assure you, uh, and then uh, two somewhat shorter comments in order to open it up as early as possible to a good discussion from the floor. Our first uh, speaker, His Excellency Pierre Chory, is the ambassador and permanent representative of Sweden to the United Nations. Uh, he has had, as of course, a long and distinguished uh, career within the um, Foreign Service, but he also began and for uh, quite a few years was an active leader in uh, Sweden's Social Democratic Party. Among his many uh, experiences, I will not go through all the postings, but among his many experiences are that he was twice the head of the uh, election oversight committee for Zimbabwe. He had the distinction of being uh, expelled from the country the second time. Uh, he has been uh, very active on migration and asylum policies in Europe, something you might well expect um, uh, given his uh, Swedish nationality. He has been Minister for International Cooperation and Development, again, a specialty uh, of Sweden that is very important to us. Uh, I will reveal, it's not uh, private, and we were just talking about it, that um, he almost also became the UN representative in Kosovo. Um, uh, the United States was what uh, perhaps to all our good blocked his appointment there. Uh, but uh, certainly he has had ample experience in hot spots around the country. And if he, uh, if anyone can tell us the realities of rogue and failed states. I suspect it will be Ambassador Shori, please. Thank you very much. It's good to be here among all the other excellencies. The other day I got an email from uh, Southern California just uh, before coming here and it started like this, I quote, declaring the US a rogue nation in violation of international law and in defiance of UN Resolution 1441, France launched a major ground offensive to overturn what they call the illegitimate regime of George W. Bush, sitting the 2000 election as proof of an unlawful government and condemning its failure to disarm its stockpiles of weapons of mass destruction. The US was further declared part of an axis of evil along with the United Kingdom and Israel. And so the political joker went on. Connecting in some way or another to the term rogue state to the United States is not restricted to a political prankster in Southern California. When I checked recent books, I saw the following titles on the shelves. Rogue Nation, America at War with the World by T.D. Allman. American Empire, Global Leader or Rogue Nation by Jim Garrison. Clyde Prestovis is even more drastic. His book is just called Rogue Nation, 
and he seems to mean it. In this very open and soul-searching society, I also find other books with the titles like At War With Ourselves, Why America Is Squandering Its Chance, Dreaming War by Gore Vidal, The Decline of American Power, The End of American Empire, and so on. Each one of us may agree or disagree with these authors, but I do think it is worthwhile to start out talking by definitions when it comes to so-called failed states and rogue nations and the role of small states and multilateral processes. Looking at the latest developments in the Middle East, some may argue that the Sharon government is moving closer to giving Israel some features of a rogue state. The targeting assassinations of Palestinians violate, obviously, international law, as does the occupation of Arab territory, and turning illegal occupation into permanent annexation only aggravates the situation. And the double standards when it comes to dealing with Israel and the UN resolutions by the United States is not lost on the wider membership of the World Organization, and it casts a shadow over our work. Israeli policies also contribute enormously in keeping the Palestinian nation in a sad, failed state situation. Years of political support and billions of dollars from the European Union have been effect effectively sabotaged by Israeli destructive <coughs> measures. The term failed states is, however, not only demeaning to my mind, and it's, it's also too blunt a definition when it comes to addressing the problem in question. My compatriot, Gunnar Myrdal, was once commissioned to study the race question in the United States, and it resulted in a book called American Dilemma. He also wrote extensively about the de developing world, and he called the weaker states, he called them the soft states, soft states. The United Nations never speak of failed states. There are instead of other, and other, a number of other terms like LDCs for least developed countries, SIDs for small island developing states, and LLDCs for landlocked developing countries. The prize for the ugliest acronym goes, however, to the World Bank for LICUR, which stands for low income countries under stress. <laughs> there are 13 LICURs in which almost 500 million of the world's most disadvantaged citizens live. 10 are African countries, one is Papua New Guinea in, in Asia, one in Caribbean Haiti, and one in Europe, Tajikistan. There are 49 LDCs, 45 SIDs, and 30 LLDCs. And most of the world countries, poorest countries, are LDCs, of course, and the overwhelming majority of them are African, 34 out of the 49. Speaking of solidarity, or the lack of solidarity of it, Kofi Annan launches a so-called consolidated appeal every year to donor countries. For 2004, the appeal is targeted to help the most vulnerable of our fellow human beings on Earth. The General Secretary asked roughly for $3 billion in humanitarian aid in order to save the lives of 45 million people. Everything indicates that this target will not be met, not even halfway. At the same time, billions and billions of dollars are quickly raised for Iraq, an oil-rich country where no one hungers and where there is no HIV AIDS. And yet we know that poverty and despair, injustices and humiliation feed violence, wars, and are a breeding ground for terrorists, potential terrorists. 95% of the global production of hard drugs occurs in countries with civil war, and when international terrorism is conducted on a larger scale, the organization needs a safe haven that can probably only be provided in, in a territory outside the control of any recognized government. Al-Qaeda chose to locate, as we know, in Taliban-held territory in Afghanistan, even though most of its recruits were not Afghans, 
It also used the wars in Sierra Leone to generate profits from the trading conflict diamonds and to store its wealth, according to the World Bank. And what do the rest of us in the developed world play? What kind of role do we play for so-called failed states? Colonialism, apartheid, Cold War rivalry have a fair share of that responsibility in the present sad state of affairs in many fragile and war-torn countries. Our lack of solidarity, political foresight, and sustainability in our supporting efforts in countries like Afghanistan and Haiti also play a role. The question of so-called humanitarian interventions to prevent genocide and ethnic cleansing cannot, of course, be avoided after Rwanda and Srebrenica and other horrors. And there is not yet consensus how this can be achieved, but the nomination, nomination of a special advisor to Kofi Annan to prevent genocide is a step in the right direction. Apart from unspeakable human suffering and loss of life, the economic costs also are huge. Bosnia, Cambodia, El Salvador, Haiti, Rwanda, and Somalia cost outside powers in economic terms a total of $85 billion. The role of small states in today's hegemonic world is perhaps reduced when it comes to so-called hard power, but nevertheless, they are vital in the world architecture. The sheer number of small states is surprising. We do have an organization called FOSS, Forum of Small States, at the United Nations, currently chaired by Singapore. You can only become a member if you are a state under 10 million inhabitants. There are more than 100 of these small states out of the 191 member states. Norway is one, and Sweden is, but we are pushing the 10 million barriers soon. Politically, small states can be very important in acute situation and crisis. Think of the courting and arm twisting by the US in the Security Council during the search for a new Iraq resolution last autumn. But small states on the Council, states like Cameroon, Chile, and Guinea, resisted. And whom did President Bush call personally after the recent escalation of resistance and deaths of occupying power soldiers in Iraq? He called the Prime Minister of Britain, the President of Poland, and the president of El Salvador. There's a big country for you. And who are the supporters of the US in the General Assembly vote after the American veto on a resolution to condemn the security barrier built by Israel on the occupied Arab land? Israel, yes, of course. But the others are Micronesia and the Marshall Islands, speaking of small states. On a more serious note, countries like Norway, Denmark, Holland, Luxembourg, and Sweden are not members of the powerful group of nations called G7, nor of the wider G77. But together we form the exclusive group of 0 0.7. And uh, the five small Nordic <coughs> countries together match gigantic USA in contributions to US pro UN programs. Norway is also a prominent diplomatic mediator and Sweden is staging a comeback in Africa by participating in all peacekeeping operations. Regional organizations like CARICOM in the Caribbean and ECOWAS in West Africa play important roles when it comes to regional stability and peacekeeping operations. But so do many small countries like Nepal, Togo, Ghana, Senegal, Uruguay, Paraguay, and so on. And the role of small countries in peacekeeping operations will most likely increase given present trends. The UN is currently running 15 peacekeeping operations with 60,000 persons serving as military personnel or civilian police. The two latest in interventions under UN auspices are Ivory Coast and Haiti. And new peacekeeping operations are being considered in Burundi and Sudan while Iraq and Cyprus are in waiting. Altogether, we may have about more than 70,000 people, men and women, under UN flag this year, reaching an all-time high. The US participation is vital, of course, in many places, but Americans are not everywhere. 
In the Democratic Republic of Congo, 53 nations are participating. 40 of these are small or medium-sized nations. There is one American, Mr. Swing, but he's a UN employee, Kofi Annan special representative. Having visited the DRC recently, I was struck by the new face of UN peacekeeping operations. It is no longer military presence alone performing military tasks only, but a multifunctional, multinational, long-term operation with robust, comprehensive mandate. MONUC, as it is called, started with a Chapter 6 mandate, not able to use force, without the right to use force in order to prevent, for instance, human rights violations or to protect civilians. But after the violence last summer in the Ituri province in Eastern Congo, the Security Council finally took its responsibility and adopted a new resolution of Chapter <coughs> 7 for Monuk, Monuk 2. And today, over 11,000 peacekeepers and other UN personnel keep the peace, protect civilians, assist in building schools and roads, setting up a National Unity Army and Police Corps, run hospitals, nutrition centers and radio stations, go after rapists and other human rights offenders, promote gender issues, rehabilitate child soldiers, all this in cooperation with the transitional government, local authorities and the civil society. Outside support is coming for a host of donor countries, the World Bank and the IMF, and the whole of the UN family. And the UNDP is in charge of the so-called DDR programs, that is disarmament, demobilization and reintegration. These pr programs are precisely the opposite to what the occupying power under, under Mr. Bremer did in Iraq, leaving tens of thousands of young men and soldiers without work. Relations with the neighbors are being improved. The situation in the DRC is fragile, but on the right track. And for South Africa and China, China, it is their first peacekeeping operation ever. The key word behind the Monuk success for me so far is legitimacy in the form of a UN mandate. It looks like nation building there. And in fact, you cannot separate effective peacekeeping from post-conflict reconstruction and nation building. You can see again the opposite in Iraq. No real plan for post-conflict. In Washington, I remember, some used to say that, I quote, nation building was the triumph of the nanny state. And they refused to see the US being a global social worker. I hope that that attitude is changing. I could also go into Haiti as another case in point, una muerte anunciada, as Garcia Marquez would say. Couldn't we all have seen the writing on the wall? A century of malign neglect, wrong minded interference and occupation, a decade of missed post conflict programs, extreme poverty and despair. If there ever was a case for the prevention of conflict, relatively easy to handle, this was it. But there was a hands-off attitude and a quick fix hope. And also an ambition to stay away from what Jesse Helms called foreign rat holes. The people of Haiti are paying today a high price for our indifference. It is now good that we have a UN-backed multilateral solution on the way. Robert Rothberg, the president of the World Peace Foundation and author of a book on Haiti, has reminded us of past failures. When the United States restored Aristide power in 1994, it began helpfully to reintroduce democratic practices and rebuild Haiti's social and psych 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 physical infrastructure. U.S. Special Forces and Green Berets constructed rural schools and jump-started local economies. But under the influence of a negative Congress majority, the US and then the UN and the OAS missions gradually withdrew, leaving the new national police force partially trained, the national economy faltering, and the judiciary subservient to the executive. And corruption and narco-trafficking continue to flourish. Let us all hope that we all have learned the lessons of prevention <coughs> and post-conflict action for the debacle in Haiti.
Roth Bay argues convincingly to my mind that the UN-backed mission will have to be committed to Haitian development and reform for a minimum of five years, some say even 20 years. Democracy takes time. It will most likely not be difficult to mobilize resources and long-term commitment from the world community this time. There are questions to ponder, however, in the aftermath of what happened in Haiti. I won't go into that. I will end by saying this. Peace, democracy, and development form a unity. Foreign aid, trade, and culture must be part of our security policy. To glorify hard power and denigrate soft power is a recipe for disaster. Who has really most power in the long run in Iraq, Bremer or Brahimi? The so-called hard-nosed security affairs people must get into their heads that foreign aid is foreign policy and an integral part of national, national and global security. An eye for an eye, jihad against jihad, made perhaps sense in the days of the Old Testament, but it is old thinking, very old thinking, and dangerous thinking in this age of advanced technology, interdependence, and weapons of mass destruction. The late Swedish Prime Minister Olof Palme used to say, our foreign policy is our first defense line. Or in other words, you can say, the best homeland security is a humane and generous foreign policy. Unilateralism brings collateral damage. Multilateralism brings collateral benefits. But we do need an effective multilateralism, which takes into consideration the concern that makes some states feel uniquely vulnerable, like the United States after 9-11 that wants effective action against new threats like the nexus between weapons of mass destruction and international terrorism. The United Nations need reforms, radical reforms, and very soon. And sorry to say, we cannot live by San Francisco rules any longer. The United Nations is not a perfect organization, but it's precious, as Kofi Annan has said. And in the struggle for a better and just world, where no man or woman should have to live in rogue states or fragile states, but live free from hunger and fear, there is no better hope than collective and sustained action through the United Nations. Nothing can replace the universality, legitimacy, and impartiality of the United Nations and its global organization and outreach. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Shorey. Our next speaker, uh, Gare Pedersen, is also, or was for many years, almost 20 years, a member of the Norwegian Diplomatic uh, Corps. Uh, he had stations in China, uh, but I would say the two most interesting elements before his current position are that he was a member of the Norwegian team to the secret Oslo negotiations between the PLO and Israel that led to the Oslo Accords. This is now, think of it, more than 10 years ago. And in the last three years of his, uh, or four years of his service in the Norwegian Foreign Service, he was the Norwegian representative to the Palestine Authority. In last year, in fact, just a year ago, this month, I believe, uh, Mr. Peterson uh, moved to the United Nations where he was appointed director of the, in the Department of Political Affairs for Asia, Pacific Division, and the Middle East. So I think again this is a relatively central and certainly a current position from which to provide some views on the topics of this symposium. Mr. Peters. Uh, thank you indeed very much. I will uh, approach um, the theme for the evening a little bit differently from what uh, Pierre did. Uh, and hopefully, after we have heard the two other members of the, the this distinguished gathering, uh, the whole thing will, will come together. Uh, let me first start by stating a few obvious things, just to remind us from sort of the, the starting point. Uh, 
And as you will recall, during the first four decades of the history of the United Nations and indeed of the Security Council, it was uh, any action was blocked, of course, by the Cold War rivalries between the Soviet Union and the United States. Uh, I have the pleasure today of working together with uh, one of the grandsons of Utant, the third Secretary General of the United Nations. And, and he told me that uh, when his grandfather uh, was Secretary General in 1967, that uh, during that first six months uh, of 1967, the Security Council only met once. And that was actually after uh, it was clear that there was going to be a war in the Middle East. Today, the Security Council meets several times, more or less every day, of course, with exceptions sometimes on Fridays and Mondays. Of course, ambassadors need some time to rest, so that's, uh, that's well understood. During the period of the Cold War, the United States did not consider it necessary to seek approval of the Security Council to make or even to threaten war. And the European powers did not expect or demand that the United States should. Or indeed, the European powers itself, when it went to war, didn't ask for, the, uh, for a main mandate from the Security Council. And as we all remember, the US interfered directly in Central Asia, in the Caribbean, uh, France and Britain uh, tried unsuccessfully to intervene in, in Egypt, and there are many, many stories about the active involvement of both the United States and European powers without going through the Security Council. The United States, of course, did not cite uh, international legitimacy or didn't even try to use that as an argument. What it cited was that it had a principle of collective self-defense. And, of course, this was based on the perceived threat in the Western world from Soviet communism. It was a much easier life, both for the United Nations and for NATO and its allies. Today, radical militant Islam has indeed not replaced communism as an agreed ideological threat to West Western liber liberal democracy. US and parts of Europe indeed do not seem to have the same perception of the threat against them. And of course, they also therefore give different answers on how to handle this very big challenge. As foreign, the German Foreign Minister Fischer stated after the war on Iraq began, what do we do when our most important partner in making decisions is, sorry, what do we do when our most important partner in, is making decisions that we consider extremely dangerous? On the other hand, what should Mr. Bush and Mr. Blair do if they are correct in their assumption that global terrorism poses unprecedented threat to the civilized world. And uh, let's also remind ourselves that actually 1999 is not very many years behind. And in 1999, what happened? Yes, of course, NATO, the United States, Europe and the United States together went to war in Kosovo. Did they ask for the approval of the Security Council? No, they did not. And why did they not? Because they knew they would not have a majority or they would not be able to have a resolution in the Council because of resistance from China and Russia. So actually France and Germany that highlighted the principles of, and the importance of a unified Security Council to go <coughs> to war actually only a few years earlier went to war without that very mandate. I think it's important that we remind ourselves of this fact. And it's also important uh, to remind ourselves that actually Henry Kissinger was one of the people who very clearly argued against and pointed out the dangers of going to war in 1999 without a mandate from the Security Council. Blair, I believe, has perhaps is perhaps the one who has delivered the most convincing argument in favor of going to war. Uh, 5th March this year, he made a speech in England uh, 
where he sort of laid uh, towards his audience where the principles for, he, for why he thought it was important to go to war. He, uh, I, I will not, I, I was actually thinking of going through this a little bit more in detail, but I will not do that because it would take too much time. But let me just sort of highlight a couple of things from that speech which I think is important to remind ourselves about. Uh, he, uh, Blair calls uh, the threat real and existential. He further argued that politicians had no choice but to confront this threat, whatever the political cost. And this, of course, is because the alternative, the possibility that terrorists might get their hands on weapons of mass destruction, was too awful to contemplate. Is it true, then the question is, of course, is it true that the threat of global terrorism has altered what Blair called the balance of risk? so that actions like the one against Iraq can be justified by considering the worst case scenario if actions is not taken. Blair's argument can easily be confused with the so-called doctrine of preemption. But I think it's more helpful to understand it as uh, a doctrine or a principle that I would call the principle of precaution. And that is that when states are faced with risks with uncertain and potentially catastrophic downsides, it's always better to err on the side of caution. For Blair then, the burden of proof is said to lie with those who don't play, play the risk of disaster rather than with those who argue that the risks are real, even if those risks might be quite small. Uh, if I would like to sort of to summarize what I believe, believe is uh, Blair's argument, I think we could say it's uh, in, one, in, in a few words, it's better safe than sorry. Or more precisely, as, as I see it, better to be sorry but safe. And Mr. Blair, of course, has used this argument rather convincingly, but we will see how it will be possible for him to, to continue during the next year and into the election problem, into the election cycle. I, of course, see several problems uh, with Blair's argument. Uh, I will not go through here and try to refute it point by point, but I will just mention if, uh, indirectly a few why these are problems. First of all, of course, who decides when to apply the principle? Do we en encourage anarchism in the international affairs if we allow action to be taken outside the Security Council? Interesting enough, what we have seen lately is actually rather the opposite, I would argue. We have actually seen a situation where even the United States feel that it's necessary to return to the Security Council time and again to get support for the different policies. And my argument is actually that what we have seen since the start of the Iraqi war is a strengthening of the UN and a strengthening of the Security Council. My next point, if war is war really uh, necessarily the most effective way in dealing with the question of terrorism and weapons of mass destruction. I believe this is it's difficult to make a convincing argument either the, the one way or the other. Uh, we have seen that uh, even the US and, and Great Britain has chosen different ways of handling these questions. When it comes to North Korea, it seems clear that uh, uh, Blair and Bush are not prepared to go to war. They will try to use negotiations. Inter interesting enough, this is also an area where they're not willing to bring it into the Security Council. This is kept outside the Security Council, as, as we all know. When it comes to Pakistan, it's even more interesting. It's a situation where actually I've seen proliferation of nuclear weapons by Pakistan but the Blair, uh, sorry, Mr. Bush has chosen actually to cooperate actively and to co-opt Mr. Musharraf's regime instead of confronting Musharraf's regime. And then, of course, India is uh, a completely different example. Then we have the example of Iran, who also proves a very difficult example. 
Here, Britain, Germany, and France took the initiative to lead in negotiations with Iran and try to stop a more aggressive American policy, and so far they have been rather successful in that initiative. And then, uh, of course, uh, perhaps the most complicating example of all is, of course, uh, Israel and, and their nuclear, uh, nuclear weapons. Then we have Afghanistan, and that's why I say it's difficult with an argument one way or another. Because I think in, when it comes to Afghanistan, most of us accepted that it was necessary to go after a state who actually sponsored terrorism. And that it was necessary to attack Al-Qaeda cells in Afghanistan. Uh, then, just also to mention another uh, example, Syria and its support of Hamas and Hezbollah. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's a situation and a country we have to follow extremely carefully. It's, I think, a place where U.S. policy has not really settled. Let's say that the war on terror is uh, successful in Iraq. Let's move to Iraq. Of course, one major challenge for, for the Americans in, uh, in, uh, in Iraq is that even if the war should be successful, it would not change the regional security environment. That even for a new Iraqi democratic regime, it would be a challenge to develop a security policy if the regional situation continues to be unstable. I will not go into any detail, but of course Iran is a challenge, Turkey for uh, Iraq would be a challenge, Syria would be, and so would Saudi, Saudi Arabia. So what would, so what would be the alternative to, uh, to, to go to war? Are there other ways of handling this uh, crisis? The Bush administration itself has indicated this, and so with Mr. Bush's speech last November, when he indirectly launched the so-called Greater Middle East Initiative. And it proves that there is a growing understanding that you don't win the war against terror through war alone. You need broader and deeper initiatives. But the question is, of course, how do you do that? And let, me, let me therefore say a few words about the question of on Arab reform. The first and starting point, of course, should be that you don't construct a reform program around the fears of outsiders, rather than the needs of the people involved. And if you read very carefully uh, what has so far surfaced from both the Americans and also from, from some Europeans, the starting point is rather the threats that the greater Middle East represents to the G8 countries rather than the need for reform in these countries. And if you are ever to see real democracy in the Middle East, I think it's important to see that this is a challenge not only to the leaders of the Middle East, but it's also a challenge for the policy in Washington. But it's also, uh, Pierre mentioned that democracy takes time, and I believe that's correct. Let me therefore just ask a few questions if we are to develop democracy in the Arab world. How do we maintain national unity, let's say in Iraq, without imposing it by force uh, once minorities have been given the freedom to speak out and to organize themselves? How to ensure that political parties develop in ways that reflect differences over policy rather than ethnic, religious, and regional divisions? And how to construct a politi political system which allows the wills of the majority to prevail while simultaneously protect, protecting the rights of the minorities. In the Arab countries today, the political dividing lines usually are drawn around religion in all its forms, with secu uh, uh, secularism as an alternative, and ethnicity, and in some cases even tribalism. The result is that voting becomes an uncertain of identity rather a reason than a reasoned choice between leaders and politicians. And in Iraq, this is what we're actually seeing today, that religion and ethnic divisions rapidly has become institutionalized, and it's sort of uh, becoming the defining elements of Iraqi politics. However, the most important uh, element in the fight against terrorism in the Arab world today would mostly have been to sort out and to solve the Arab-Israeli conflict. I see the Arab-Israeli conflict today basically as 
uh, a fight between two narratives. The Palestinian narrative is that they are fighting occupation and they're fighting occupation by all means. The Israeli narrative is that they are fighting an existential threat. And the existential threat, of course, if you feel that you are threatened and that you are close to be driven out of the sea, you are entitled to use any means to defend yourself. What we are lacking today is basically a willingness, and here this is a challenge to the American uh, administration, to act genuinely even-handed and to propose a comprehensive peace that could uh, be sold to the Arab and the Israeli public as a generally equitable and would seriously then undermine the extremist groups and begin to marginalize them. Terrorists would be forced onto infertile ground. Of course, it wouldn't change the threat from terrorists overnight, but strategically, the terrorists would be dramatically undermined. Of course, the question of failed or rogue states is, is a complicated one, and because it also involves sort of challenges on, on, in, in a wide, uh, in a wide, uh, in, in wide and different areas. Uh, and Pierre has mentioned it, so I, I will not repeat all of it, but just it, it's a question of humanitarian disaster, endemic civil wars, flow of refugees, internal di displaced people, and uh, and many, many other problems. Let me conclude by on a more sort of optimistic note. During the past decade, global security, and this is, uh, this is a claim I, I would like to make, has undergone an extra, extraordinary and largely unnoticed sea change. Contrary to conventional wisdom, the number of wars, international crises, genocides, and international terrorist attacks all declined sharply in the past de decade. In 2002, there were actually 40% fewer armed conflicts than in 1992, while the number of in international terrorist attacks also had dropped steadily since the mid-1980s. Wars are not only less numerous, they are also less deadly. Deaths per conflict per year have been declining for at least three decades. These dramatic declines remain, I'm afraid, largely unacknowledged. The reasons for this are many, and I will not go into that. But the reason why we, have no, why we are now seeing uh, fewer wars and fewer deaths are basically, of course, the end of the Cold War, and also that we are seeing more democratic regimes. But thirdly, and for us, perhaps the most important observation is that this is not only due to the end of Cold War and the emerging of new democracies, but also that the Cold War liberated the UN and allowed the UN for the first time to play the global security role its founders had intended. Since the end of the 1990s, the UN has spearheaded an extraordinary upsurge in conflict prevention and post-conflict peace-building activities, and most of these efforts have been directed against civil wars. And there are five areas I would just like to highlight. It's first, a greatly increased reliance on preventive diplomacy and peacemaking initiatives, with a consequent upsurge in negotiated peace settlements and the resulting decline in number of wars that are fought to exhaustion. Two, an equally dramatic increase in complex post-conflict peace operations, and Pierre has mentioned some of them to you involving an ever-growing range of peace-building activities that have helped to prevent reoccurrence of armed conflicts. Three, a greater willingness on the part of the Security Council to authorize the use of force, which has in turn helped to deter aggression and sustain peace agreements. Four, an increased willingness to challenge the culture of impunity demonstrated by the proliferation of transitional justice mechanisms such as war crimes tribunals and truth and reconciliation commissions. And finally, five, a, great, a greater emphasis on designing development policies that addresses the root causes of political violence. Notwithstanding, of course, these encouraging developments, there are few reasons for complacency. In many parts of the world, political violence remains appallingly high, 
while the possibility of terrorist organizations acquiring and subsequently using weapons of mass destruction cannot be ignored. In some regions, is, in particular in sub-Saharan Africa, warfare actually increased through much of the past decade. And despite the wave of recent peace settlements on that continent, the structural conditions that gave rise to war in the first place have in many cases worsened. And as I already have mentioned, changing circumstances in the Middle East and elsewhere could also reignite old wars or trigger new ones. But while there is room for, no room for complacency, nor is there room for any or need for pessimism, the UN's success in helping to reduce armed conflict worldwide has been achieved despite inappropriate mandates, inadequate, inadequate resources, many follow-ups, and also uh, a lot of uh, po uh, different hard political struggle. The lesson is that with a clear mandate, with strong support from member states, the UN can improve the situation even further. Thank you for your... Thank you, Mr. Peterson. Well, that nicely brackets, I think, the uh, uh, evaluation of the issues, and so we'll leave it in the first cut to the panelists to see whether they want to uh, explode the envelopes further outward or whether they want to bring them back uh, into a smaller compass uh, of convergence. The first commentator is our colleague, Professor Stephen Krasner, uh, Department of Political Science, Stanford University. Uh, he has uh, been for many years, at least as I knew him, uh, the leading figure in international political economy issues, uh, global resources, global economic power, and so forth. But he has also, uh, and this is perhaps the single most important uh, element also, for the uh, second element for tonight, he has been increasingly involved in the study of the basic issues of the relationship of national sovereignty to the new uh, uh, realities of our globe. His uh, recent book of a few years ago on sovereignty with the telling subtitle, Organized Hypocrisy, uh, perhaps gives you some sense for uh, the direction. More generally, his work on the problems of sovereignty, problematic sovereignty, as is the title of a uh, major uh, book out of a conference that he uh, led, uh, gives you a sense of where uh, his interests are. Uh, in this area, obviously, uh, resources are also an essential element. I don't know, frankly, whether that is going to be your uh, main focus or whether it will be directly on these issues of failed states and rogue states, but it will be interesting. Steve Krasner. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Dick. Um, well. The advantage of these two talks was there was almost nothing left out, so I could pick and choose, but I'm going to try uh, actually not to do that and to confront some of these issues head on since I'm very sympathetic with uh, many of, you know, the, 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 the dilemmas and, and um, paradoxes which uh, Mr. Peterson elaborated, and, and I would say, um, I'd like to say I, I disagreed with almost everything that Ambassador Shuri said, but in fact, I disagreed with everything he said. So <laughs> it's hard for me to say anything that I didn't disagree with. So I will actually try to confront some of these issues head on. It seems to me if we look at the um, present global environment, um, at least one way of getting a grip on what's happening is this. Um, to recognize that sovereignty is a way of organizing political life um, has been transformed, failed, and been questioned in unprecedented ways. Uh, there are areas of the world, if you think about sovereignty as a set of well-governed states that have effective control over their own territories that are recognized, that are autonomous in the sense that they set their own um, domestic institutions, there are still a few states in the world that operate under this conventional uh, kind of umbrella of sovereignty. The US is one, Japan is another, China is certainly a third. 
uh, and there are a few others scattered around the world, and they do fit the conventional sovereignty model. If you look at Western Europe, Western Europe has been utterly transformed by the European Union. Europe's experience in the 20th century was that they managed to kill 100 million people, and if the United States hadn't intervened, they would have ended up being governed by the Nazis. That was not a very good outcome uh, if you're thinking about how the sovereign state system was supposed to operate. Or maybe it would have been the Nazis and the Soviets, but some combination of the two. Not very attractive. Europe has, since the late 1940s, transformed itself. Um, the member states of the European Union are not conventionally sovereign states. Uh, Europe has created, through a set of voluntary agreements, supranational institutions like the European Court of Justice, uh, the Commission. Um, they've created um, institutional mechanisms for supermajorities um, in many specific areas of, of foreign policy. The European states are no longer autonomous and they are no longer juridically independent. And for most Europeans, this is an extremely good thing. And I would say for the world, it's basically a very good thing. And it has also clearly created a set of institutional arrangements, at least for Europe, which have been extremely positive and productive. It was not obvious in 1991 that Central Europe was going to become a consolidated set of democratic regimes. And maybe you would have bet on it, but you couldn't have bet, it on, bet on it with certainty. One reason I think this has happened, and happened as smoothly as it has, is because the European Union has been such an effective institution. It's been a tremendous magnet um, for uh, the consolidation of democracy in Central Europe. Uh, and it's created a set of incentives that allowed Central European political leaders essentially to move in only one direction. Even if you look at the situation in the Balkans, which is very messy and not that attractive, in the long run, one can imagine um, a European solution for the Balkans. Uh, and it's easier to imagine a European solution exactly because Europe does not envision Bosnia uh, or Croatia as conventionally sovereign states. Slovenia is already on its way to being a member state of the EU. Uh, so that within Europe, you've had, I think, a transformation of conventional sovereignty. That's what's happened on one end of the spectrum. On the other end of the spectrum, um, sovereignty is a mode of governance. If it hasn't failed, it's doing extremely badly in many parts of the world, of which sub-Saharan Africa is the most obvious. Uh, and by doing badly, what I mean is, if you're looking at life expectancy, measures of per capita income, human development indices, they've fallen in Africa for the sub-Saharan Africa as a whole over the course of the last two decades, and they've fallen in most sub-Saharan African countries. That also was not obvious. I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Nigeria from 1963 to 65. Um, we didn't go with the expectation that we were saving a failed state. Um, you know, we went with the kind of expectation. It was a little naive, I grant that. But, you know, with the expectation that you were going to be contributing to development in, in a kind of newly independent democratic state that had freed itself from colonialism. Uh, in many post-colonial countries, things have clearly worked out much worse than we expected. And if we're looking at um, the issues that confront the most difficult issues, I think, in the contemporary world, I mean, what we're looking at are states that have failed in the sense um, that central government authority has collapsed uh, and that the well-being of, of the populations in these states is extremely diminished. That's a small number of states. Uh, states that are badly governed or states that are threatening in which, okay, we, we being the United States, go out and fail the state ourselves, uh, which we've done in Afghanistan and Iraq. We have some sense, I think, about what we need to make these places or what these places need to function better. They need some set of institutions um, which create security, which uh, create effective property rights, which establish law, which guarantee basic human rights, um, including, I would say, opportunities for women. Um, so it's not, it's not too mysterious, I mean, what the kind of building blocks are for a reasonably well-functioning polity. What is not at all obvious is how we get there. Um, there's one way in which we might get there, which uh, is kind of optimistical, I'm, I'm not at all sure it's right, uh, 
And that is that places spiral down, they kind of hit a bottom, and they get the opportunity to remake themselves. I, I think that's probably too optimistic an assessment. It's an assessment that would say to the wealthy industrialized world, actually, what we should do is just leave these places alone. Uh, state building is a messy process. It was certainly an extremely messy process in Europe. It's a messy process in other parts of the world as well, and we might do just as well to step back. If we did that, we'd obviate, I think, some of the difficulties that we're now confronting if you're looking at, at, at conflicts uh, between the United States uh, and Europe. That's not likely to happen. I think it's probably an incorrect prescription, although I'm not totally sure about that empirically. Uh, I think what's more likely to happen is that external actors will pr try to play some role in creating more decent institutional environments uh, in these places that are not functioning very well. There are ways to do that which are very conventional, like governance assistance. Um, there are ways to do that, which some of you have heard me speak about before here, in which you might want to think about creating new institutional arrangements, which I call shared sovereignty, uh, in which you try to get better governance by systematically engaging external actors in domestic authority structures in badly governed states. The most obvious place where this would work, or could work, uh, would be oil exporting countries. Oil has been an engine, basically, of degradation, autocracy, and uh, actually negative economic growth. The reasons for this are pretty well understood. You have a lot of oil. If you have a state with a lot of oil, and you're an ambitious person in that state, there's one thing you want to do to make yourself rich and powerful, and that's seize control of the state apparatus. That's what's happened in virtually, not in virtually, in every third world country, in every developing country that's discovered oil. oil. And the two places where it hasn't happened are Alaska and Norway. Uh, but they had pretty well developed institutional structures to begin with. You know, so if we were starting, if the starting point was Norway, it would be much easier to deal with this problem. One thing that you might think about doing uh, for oil exploitation, this is a shared sovereignty idea, would be to create um, an oil trust uh, the board of directors of the trust would be drawn, appointed both by the oil exporting country and by some external actors like the World Bank. Uh, the trust would actually be domiciled in another country like Norway, for instance. The board of directors would be subject to the legal system uh, under which boards of directors operated in the country where it was domiciled. This is not a perfect solution, as we know from Enron, uh, but it's better than what we have now. The oil companies would be obligated to put um, all of their payments into an international escrow account. And payments from the escrow account would have to be approved by this trust. Um, the payments, the funds would be used for purposes that were designated by the national government. Uh, but if you had the trust actually overseeing the expenditures, you wouldn't end up with the kind of situation you ended up in, with in Nigeria under um, Sani Abacha, where $5 billion, or God only knows how much, uh, money ended up in uh, foreign bank accounts. All right, that's an idea. Shared sovereignty is an idea. It's a more a ambitious one. You might even think about making recognition contingent or forms of international recognition contingent on decent behavior. You know, it's not clear that you automatically, if you have a state that's bad, extremely badly governed or extremely abusive, in terms of the way in which it treats its own population, it's not obvious that you want to give it automatically diplomatic recognition or automatically uh, give it a seat in the United Nations, which is something that's extremely valuable and almost everybody wants. All right, if we think about uh, these more ambitious ways of dealing with bad governance, and I would say even some of the less ambitious ones, if we think, for instance, about a greater Middle East initiative, which is certainly something that the Americans and Europeans could think about together. Um, I have to say, when I listen to Ambassador Shuri, I despair, and I mean this genuinely, and, and not as a, as a kind of policy statement, because I think his views and, uh, are indicative of a division between the United States and Europe, which is deep and real, and I worry about how, in how many places it will be bridgeable. Um, all right, let me suggest why, why I think that's the case. All right, there's the obvious problem, which, I mean, I wish I could say it was transitory, but I don't think it is. The United States has a heck of a lot of power, and Europe doesn't have very much. If the Europeans are actually willing to commit um, the level of resources that the United States commits to military activity, they might actually be able to balance the United States, and that might not be a bad thing at all. I see no indication um, in European uh, 
Domestic politics, that that's likely to be the case. I mean, the biggest European country, Germany, is in no way going to double um, its expenditures on defense and reconfigure what it's doing with its military. So th that's a, a structural problem, which I think will be with us for a long time. The United States spends more money now on, on its military apparatus than the next 20 countries, that's one figure, or than everybody else combined in the rest of the world. This is not something which is going to change quickly, A. So it's not surprising, soft power, hard power. If you don't have any hard power, it's not surprising that you would talk a lot about soft power. That's what any international relations scholar would tell you. Um, the second problem, though, I think is, is also one that's, that's deep and real, and it's related to the su success of the European Union. If you were a, a European in, in, in the late 1940s, if you were someone like Robert Schumann, who was one of the, the kind of progenitors of, of uh, the European community, and you, you would never in your wildest dreams have imagined that the European Union would have emerged as such a successful institution. It would have been mind-boggling. No one would have guessed it. And I think if you ask how that happened, I mean, there are a set of peculiar circumstances, but certainly one thing that happened was that European leaders enunciated a set of aspirations for what the world should be like, and lo and behold, they were actually realized. Now, you can argue that there may be material reasons for this, or that the US played a major role in this in terms of providing a security umbrella, but regardless, these aspirations were actually realized. And they have been a major motivation, I think, in a major way in which Europeans look at the world. If you look, for instance, at the Kyoto Protocol, all right, it's a nonsensical agreement. And if it was implemented, say, in the United States, it would be a world depression, which would be absolutely devastating. All right, so why do you have this kind of, I mean, Europeans know this as well as Americans. It's not a mystery. Why do you find this tremendous difference of um, uh, views on the Kyoto Protocol? I think it's because there is this sense in Europe that by enunciating aspirations, values, putting them out, discussing them, they actually can, you can alter people's basic views about how the political system can work. And Europe can look at the European Union and say, you know, it actually happened. Germany in 2004 is certainly very, very different from Germany in 1938. And while the European Union isn't the only thing that's contributed to that, it's certainly one thing that contributed to that. I think Americans, and this has been traditional, not exclusively, but it's certainly true now, have looked at the inter international environment much more as a set of issues that have to do with realizing material objectives, some of which are security and some of which are economic, and maybe it's not surprising again that the most powerful state would do that. I mean, the Americans have certainly also had certain aspirational goals, and some of them are reflected uh, in the present administration. So I think this difference between Seeing the international environment as kind of as, as working through a set of aspirations on the one hand, and seeing the international environment as working through a set of material goals on the other, is a second, aside from the power differences, a deep disagreement between Europe and the United States. These differences also, and this is not a uniform difference between Europe and the United States, reflect domestic values. The Scandinavian countries, as Ambassador Shuri said, give 0.7 percent or 0. 0 one, seven tenths of one percent of their GNP or more for foreign assistance. The United States gives uh, about one tenth of one percent now, and if uh, the current administration's new foreign aid it, initiative, the Millennium, Millennium Challenge Account, is implemented, the U.S. would get up to 0.15 of a per percentage point. It's pretty clear from the academic work that it just reflects domestic values. It absolutely tracks government percentage of GNP which is around 50% in a number of the Scandinavian countries and about 30% in the U.S. The differences between the U.S. and European countries, not all of them, but many of them, in terms of attitudes about the role of the state and what the state should be doing are very different. Uh, these things don't look bridgeable. If you look at the difference between attitudes on the Israeli-Palestinian um, conflict, the European view is that basically this is a result of a series of injustices. Uh, and if the, in, if the injustices were transformed, um, you would have a situation, especially by Israel reforming its policies, you'd be able to reach a decent solution. All right, I admit, I look at this, I think these are a set of different interests in which the Europeans have played a tremendously negative role by reassuring the Palestinians that if they just hold out, they'll get something better than what they can get now. I think the fact is, the accords that were reached at the end of the Clinton administration were the only accords that you could actually base a settlement on. There have to be two states. 
There has to be a division of Jerusalem. There will be some kind of border rectification, and there's not going to be a Palestinian right of return. What else could happen? What else could happen? And one of the mysteries of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict is that we, we know what the solution has to be. And it's also, I mean, a lot of Palestinians, in some ways, Israelis, must also know this. It can't be a mystery. There isn't any other possible solution. You have to ask why this solution hasn't been realized. And certainly one of the reasons is because all of the parties think, although they know what their power is on the ground, that somehow they're going to get assistance from outside. I think the fact that Arafat turned down and rejected the solutions which Clinton offered were a true tragedy. And I think the reason why that happened is because Arafat would rather be a world political figure than the president of a small corrupt state, which is what Palestine would have been. Now, I want to say, this is a really, I would say what I just enunciated, whether you agree with it or not, is a lot closer to the American position than it is to what people think in Europe. And this also looks to me like a deep and unbridgeable divide. All right, I'm going to end, I mean, there are other, I mean, I think, things that you could elaborate, but I think we're dealing with a political environment in which, I think as Mr. Peterson said, in a security sense, what you're dealing with for the United States, and in some ways for Europe as well, is a small probability of a truly disastrous event. The European view of dealing with terrorism is that we ought to think about it as a crime um, and try to treat it as a criminal activity. So the Europeans are tremendously upset about Guantanamo, way more upset than Americans. The American view is this is a war. These people that we're dealing with in Guantanamo are not criminals. They are prisoners of war, or enemy combatants, or whatever term we made up to deal with them. These are also deep differences, and it's not clear who's right here. I mean, in the next five years, are we going to have 10 more mega terrorist events or zero? You know, is Islamic terrorism really a threat to the security of the Western world? Possibly. Or is this something that's been wildly exaggerated by some policymakers in the United States? George Bush, and this is true, genuinely worries about a dirty nuclear weapon going off in a major American city, killing one or two or more million people, and making that place uninhabitable for your lifetime, everybody sitting in this room. You know, has he dramatically exaggerated this threat, or is it real? And in dealing with this kind of environment of tremendous uncertainty, I do think that these differences in view between the United States and Europe are deep and real and not bridgeable and hard to find a way to actually make, uh, make the US and, and Europe work better together. And that's, I, I think, a sad but unfortunate inescapable, inescapable reality at this point in history. David, you have a Herculean task in front of you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Karen is a colleague at the School of Law. He, has, he has, holds uh, a major position in the field of public international law there. He has been on many uh, commissions in uh, the field, including most recently the United Nations uh, uh, Council uh, commission, co uh, Compensation Commission dealing with the uh, compensation claims. Uh, from the first Gulf War. He writes in this field, uh, and perhaps the fact that he began his uh, professional life as a uh, salvage diving officer in the U.S. Navy will give him a unique perspective on where to come here. David. Oh, thank you. Um, that was quite a performance. I don't think I have as coherent a reply. I think one thing I would have learned from not being in the Navy, but being in our Coast Guard um, when I served during Vietnam. The, uh, it is very, there is no unbridgeable gap. It's all a matter of listening, and listening is hard to do. Um, and I would say that's to both sides um, in any situation. Well, our topic tonight was fail states, rogue states. Um, what to do, how do we do it? I have to say, um, it's not so much that we end on an optimistic note or a pessimistic note, but perhaps just a determined note at the depth of these problems uh, that are confronting us. Um, what was um, said, not said by our commentators? On the one hand, one thing, um, certainly from Ambassador Shuri, and I'm not 
I'm listening also here to um, Professor Krasner. On fail states, we're not saying that it's not our problem. On the other hand, um, it is um, somehow wrapped in sovereignty about the choice we will make about that problem. There is some comfort in the idea that it's not totally um, not our problem. Um, but what I found when I made a transition with both the ambassador and uh, Mr. Paterson's remarks is obviously they, I don't picture them, they are Western Europe, but also I picture more here there's a very strong UN influence. Their answer in part, certainly on how we do it, is that we're doing it multilaterally, we're doing it with the UN, and there is a certain confidence there. There's, when I was listening to Ambassador Shuri, there was um, a dissonance for me because on the one hand there was um, a great discussion about states, and on the other hand a discussion about people a discussion about sovereignty and at the same time something about shared governance. So on the one hand we heard numbers of states. We heard about 100 states with less than 10 million people. Um, to me that's something coming out of the UN, this counting of states, um, as opposed to the question of um, the emphasis on the people themselves, the problem of what is a failed state, trying to define it, we had a narrow definition from Professor Krasner. I think we're all in agreement it's hard to define it. On the narrow end, there probably are not many. On the broader end, a failed state is um, actually just a manifestation of tremendous poverty in the world. That's not to say it hasn't existed before, but the inequality is tremendous. There are 6.2 billion people in the world. Five billion, by World Bank estimates, are below the world poverty line. Now, we started talking about the Secretary General, the, the statistic to us was 3 billion for the 45 million most at risk. Um, and his frustration to see such a small number as opposed to the number being spent on security. There's a similar frustration expressed by the President of the World Bank um, where his responsibility, he views it, is somehow addressing this, the status of these 5 billion people. And when he sees virtually all donor money um, being somehow aimed toward the 20 million in Iraq. So a very small percentage. Five billion, we have to remember that's 5,000 million, right? Um, the ambassador referred positively to the number of missions and the people. And I guess I would, in, from the description I was just giving, I would have to ask more again about what is the progress. Some years ago, I worked on a progress, uh, project concerning catastrophes. And as in many of these projects, we spent most of the time defining a catastrophe. Um, and there was uh, one member of the group who pushed very hard on poverty as being a catastrophe. But um, one thing that was clear is the inequality is so great, the percentages, whether it's our 0.15 perhaps or 0.7, uh, whatever percentage one is giving, um, that it is far more demand than we are going to be able to give. And so the image, once as we got farther and farther this, into this whole project, was that catastrophe and the response to catastrophe is to bring someone back if it's a systemic catastrophe. In other words, it's not an earthquake, but it's flowing out of a society on the edge so a drought becomes a catastrophe rather than a manageable event as it would be in other countries. Um, the basic response is to pull them back to the brink and not any further. So when the ambassador referred, and when both speakers referred to democracy in the long haul, that is a long haul with a lot of commitment of funds. And that is not the, the history of overseas assistance. So I'm not quite sure, I, I'm, I would say that is not an optimistic note for me, that it requires a long-term commitment in many parts of the world to accomplish that. And we heard a rather long list from the ambassador himself. Um, Mr. Peterson, he, he was more concerned with the rogue state, um, and he mentioned the balance of risk. And the idea it's better to be safe than sorry. I, um, I have always thought of that. I think it's a very complicated scheme to work out about how one accomplishes that. And it goes much further uh, if you push at that. First of all, 
Better safe than sorry, that's an assessment of risk, that means a knowledge of risk, that means intelligence, it means an assessment of intelligence. And all of those are factors we have become unclear about, less sure about, um, with major decisions being taken. There was one interview I recall with uh, Ken Edelman uh, last fall where he likened the president to a CEO. And he said, of course, the best CEO is the one who moves on the profit before you know there's a profit, right? So too would the best president move on the risk before it's even known that there's a risk. And that's true, but on the other hand, there's a lot riding on that risk. And maybe in one case it's a shareholder, and in the other case it's um, individual lives and national commitment of funds to, that could be used for other uses. I'm not so optimistic as Mr. Paterson about the strengthening of the UN Security Council. It is true that the U US has returned to the Security Council um, numerous times since the invasion. Um, how could we think about that for a moment? First of all, in terms of strengthening, um, the actual actions are not unusual themselves. Um, it's, I think, really an expression that perhaps in a political science sense there is some learning going on here that it is a good thing to use to be multilateral, to use others to somehow take advantage of this system. Um, I'm not sure that that lesson in that deep sense is being learned. I do think there are some things that are changing, however. One, the cost is dramatically different. And we need to bear that in mind. The Gulf War cost $70 billion to the United States. Uh, that was reimbursed entirely by Germany, Japan, and the Gulf states. This war is already at 165, and there's probably another supplemental after the election of 70 billion, if these uprisings have not changed that entire calculation. Um, that will be borne entirely by the United States. There is no shift there. The, as we've talked about, as we've heard about, Con consistently, the multilateral face is not present. Um, what would the multilateral face be? It would not be different boots on the ground, I doubt. Basically, I think Professor Krasner is basically right. This is the only army that really can be there. On the other hand, whether would it have succeeded um, if it had had a multilateral face, if the Indians had been there, if the Moroccans had been there, if the Egyptians, as in the Gulf War, had been there? Um, that's a different calculus. Would there be fewer deaths? Um, finally, I would like to, uh, I didn't, I must say I'm, I'm not entirely sure what Mr. Paterson suggested as alternatives. Um, but I would like to say as far as learning, uh, one thing that I, I found distressing and the importance for, for listening. After 9-11, uh, we certainly had a lot of sympathy and uh, we the United States and a lot of room to maneuver and act in a primarily unilateralist way. Um, what I think was unfortunate was, even for those who are very uh, skeptical of multilateralism or the shared governance structures and note their weaknesses, we had, in addition, a tremendous opportunity at that moment to remake all those institutions any way we wanted. Um, and I think it would have taken our lead to do it and a great deal of mixture of power and diplomacy. I did not take from our speakers that they said how hard power should be um, eschewed in favor of soft power, but rather I took that what is more commonly accepted, that they must go hand in hand, and that what has in fact happened more in this time is the loss of soft power, which I think is unfortunate. And um, I'll just end with, um, that of course the issue is still sovereignty. Um, if we think of the, the poverty, and one thing that has not come up is why is the persistence of it here? How, how would we address it? Uh, Professor Krasner has pointed to uh, some shared governance models. I would point out that it's sovereignty itself that uh, leads to some of the poverty in, in, in the first place. Or not the poverty, but its persistence in the form it is. In particular, in the United States, we would not think of overseas development assistance within our country, in part it's solved by movement of peoples. I'm not advocating some change in the rule about movement of peoples, but the strict rules that Western Europe and the United States and others have about movement of people all evidence a uh, deep core resilience to sovereignty. 
These people are trapped in the world they are born in, and their fate is defined by those borders. And we do send some assistance to those countries, but that is our sovereign choice also, and sovereignty is buried very deeply here. Thank you. We have a good 20 to 30 minutes for discussion. I have uh, explicit consent from Ambassador Shorey, and I will take implicit consent from Mr. Peterson that rather than have a second round of discussion among the panel, it would be interesting to hear comments and questions from you. So we'll open it uh, right now already to that. Um, I don't know who to address this to. But isn't the unbridgeable gap that there is one between Europe and the Bush administration, not between Europe and America? Exactly. No. I think that everything, the power asymmetries are not a function of the present administration. The differences in attitude towards how the international environment works are not a function of the present administration. Commitments to levels of foreign aid are not a function of the present administration. And assessments of how you should think about terrorism, war versus crime, is also not, in my view, a function of the present administration. I mean, you might comfort yourself in thinking that is, but we're, certainly the structural issue isn't going to change. You know, I mean, it's true that Clinton, I mean, made noises about Kyoto and the ICC, for instance, but there was no way in which they were ever going to be ratified. Excuse me, but there was a Republican Congress. Oh, you think that, you think you could have, I, there's, okay. I don't think there's any chance that either of those would have been ratified by any imaginable Congress that you could think Democrat or Republican in the U.S. I think that's a fact. So I think that's, I, I, anyway, I, I don't, I think that these are structural differences and not differences that just reflect the administration. It's clear that the, the administration exacerbates you know, has exacerbated some of these questions, but I think it's too easy to think that if Kerry's elected, this is all going to go away. No, My I prediction would be that it won't. Well, I, I agree with you, but, but, um, but that's because the, uh, the country has moved so far to the right anyway. Well, that may also be to say it's a structural problem, right? I mean, it's not just the politics. Okay. Uh, Ambassador Shorey, you have a comment? Well, I, I do agree with you. I mean, we had a if you look at the opinion polls in Europe, I mean, the, the, there's a sea change since the Bush administration came in and its policies started to work. There is a complete, uh, I mean, a complete reversal on many, many, many questions which are fundamental values to uh, importance to, let's see, traditional European policies and the way we look at the world and the world order and uh, uh, legitimacy and, and so on, the rule of law internationally too. I mean, uh, we heard, I mean, let's take defense, for instance. Why should Europe, why, in, why should we try to match the United States and catch up? It's absurd. Why should we have that? Why should we follow the Reagan build-up and now the Bush build-up? It's crazy. I mean, it's a different view of see, seeing the threat perception here. And then the same thing, I mean, we are developing now kind of a standby force uh, drawing on national assets of 60,000 people and 5,000 police, which we can set in. And uh, I see now also that the Bush administration is planning for uh, a similar thing for Africa now, for peacekeeping in Africa. That's very good. It's needed. But, but we don't need such an enormous build-up. Uh, we, we, we want to, we would like to see also the internal security matters, which has to do with joblessness, which has to do with homelessness, which has to do with injustices and so on. We, and, um, so it's a different perception, if you so want, but not so different from, let's say, previous American administrations. I mean, for God's sake, so start with FDR, if you so want. I mean, both the views on international institutions and international law and the welfare society, if you so want. So, and my final point would be that when we are discussing these things, especially the Middle East in this country, it's very difficult. It's like pushing a button, boom. <laughs> but then we, it's not, has nothing to do with anti-Israeli or anti-Americanism. It has to do that we, uh, we dislike some of the policies of this administration and some of the policies of the, Bush, uh, of the Sharon administration. It has nothing to do with the countries. Uh, David. Yeah. Well, if I could just stay with that a second longer. I, I, 
I take pre Professor Krasner can uh, correct me here. If it sounds, if his view doesn't sound uh, to resonate with you, I mean, I think it, he's not speaking to the fact that there would be a great split within the population of the United States. I think rather he's suggesting that somehow the structure of our interests would lead the people in the policy planning staff and the State Department and in certain positions to be remarkably consistent over time, uh, whoever they are. Now, what, what I would like to disagree with for a moment is we, we did a study of multilateralism and Professor Krasner used the word exacerbate. Um, and there are a number of editorials that suggest that all this administration has done differently is, is it spoken its mind too clearly, uh, thereby bringing about this change within Europe, um, and please reduce the tone. Um, and in the work we did, what we found also, I, I don't think it's only that, um, and that was not our conclusion, that actually there is a withdrawal from process, uh, withdrawal from education of one another. If you take Kyoto, Kyoto has tremendous problems. I wouldn't say it's nonsensical. It's a very tough problem about how to deal with it. And, but the, as compared to the Clinton administration uh, and pre previous administrations generally, the Clinton administration is also has a, a similar interest analysis that uh, was described. But they would have stayed at the table. They would have educated others. They would have thought about what is the best agreement for the world, if not for us. What is the best agreement that we might someday join? Um, because at some point or another, we're going to have to do something about this. Um, this has, that was partly my last comment. We could have not, instead of, our basic approach was to withdraw from meeting after meeting, after 9-11, one month after, we withdrew from, we scuttled the biological weapons inspection protocol that had been developed for seven years. Now, why did we do that? I mean, it, there, there are reasons to do it, but it was, we could have remade that as strong as we wanted to. Now, the problem was we didn't want it as strong as we wanted it to be, <laughs> but, the, you know, again, uh, the, the prob there is an attitudinal problem, uh, and I don't think they're learning on that point, but uh, this administration, per se. Yes. In many of the EU states, citizens feel either apathetic or, or negative towards the European Union, and I was wondering why you think this was, and also what the impact was on the goal of listening, as Professor Karen ended with. On the goal of... I, I, I didn't get the first part of li Listening. Okay. Well, I think, Steve, since you spoke about the EU, maybe you should tackle it. What <laughs> class did you learn that from? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah the, I mean, the, the question was, um, you know, in many EU states, um, citizens seem apathetic or uninterested in the EU, and what does that mean if we're thinking about listening? Okay, first, I don't actually know what the data is. I mean, you know, I think over time, there's actually been an increase in uh, kind of measures of European identity and the extent to which people identify them, themselves as European. I, I don't think what you're saying is wrong, but it doesn't belie the fact that if you look at a lot of European policy, it's been transformed up to this level at Brussels which is a very extraordinary thing. And that if you think about, I mean, especially what I was alluding to Central Europe, the fact that you had this magnet, um, this tremendous lodestone to which Central European states were attractive is very striking. I mean, to be a member state, you have to accept, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of pages or however many it is of European community law. It's really amazing. So I think what you're saying, I mean, may be absolutely accurate, um, but I think it doesn't, it still doesn't belie the fact that the European Union is really an extraordinary and I would say historically unprecedented institution and a real departure from conventional sovereignty. If I may add and one. I don't think it's sorry. going to disappear even though you might have this level of apathy in some countries. I'd like to ask you though, just in that connection something, would the, what you have called the European approach post-war to these issues, perceptions, categorizations, so on, would they be that much different if we still had a peaceful but independent set of European states at most involved with each other in a kind of customs market but otherwise still fully independent? I'm not sure I see that it is the European Union and its 
you know, uh, dominance in what began as economic and market affairs that have really created this sea change in attitude that you're describing. Okay, for, you know more about this than I do. So I could make well, an argument because, like, I'm a professor and that's what we're trained to do. But it wouldn't but, indicate that I knew what I was talking about. <laughs> well, but I it mean, is, the, the argument, I mean, I, the only thing I would say here is that, and I have no evidence for this, okay, is that you had these aspirations and it's kind of amazing how far they were realized. That's all I'm thinking. And the realization of the aspirations confirmed that this was really a viable way of approaching international relations. So it wasn't just calculating, you know, it wasn't just Volkswagen thinking, oh, we're going to have a bigger market if we integrate. But the fact that you were able to move towards these supranational institutions, get rid of all these borders, um, change people's attitudes. But, I, you know, honestly, I don't, I don't have data that would support what I'm saying. Well, can I, uh, can I just, um, just on the listening point, because it is, it is a hard thing, but I, I would just say earlier, uh, Mr. Peterson referred to uh, the Israeli narrative, the Palestinian narrative. Those narratives are so refined, right? They're so developed. It's very hard to listen at all in that framework uh, once you get to that level. To me, there's a similar, very interest-based analysis that is very refined in the upper levels of our State Department, for example. Um, it's very effective at certain things. Certain things don't get through in that analysis. It's very easy to dismiss as relatively marginal uh, the value of soft power. A word like legitimacy seems ambiguous and loose, and how does that fit in with my narrative? And I don't know where to go with that, is sort of the reaction. So it's... Um, I just think it's hard because we train ourselves to become more and more refined in these specialized narratives. What is, is there a, a, a plan or an ambition to have a force that can be deployed even during violent conflicts, not keeping a peace, but maybe stop, stop the violence, like in Iraq, for example? What would the UN be able to do when there is no peace to keep? <laughs> Must be for you. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you worked your, at the UN. <laughs> there is after Rwanda, 10 years ago, Rwanda, uh, and the Balkans, this uh, strong feeling that the UN must step in before a conflict of this nature erupts. And uh, it has been very difficult to get consensus. It has been impossible to get consensus on this before. Uh, and therefore, one step in the right direction is that Kofi Annan, using his mandate, so to say, has uh, nominated, will nominate the person as special advisor on prevention of genocide and ethnic cleansing, a massive violation of human rights. And to interact with the Security Council. Uh, that is a small step, but certainly all the UN programs that uh, Gay Peterson mentioned are conflict prevention. Uh, in a lot, you know, I would also draw it even further. It's also counter-terrorism, if you so want, by, by preventing uh, conflict and injustices and promoting development and so on. So, of course, there are a lot of things. All the UN programs are developed in, into that sense. But the, when we are talking about peacekeeping, is because this is a primary, original, the original task of the United Nations is to prevent wars. And, um, and there we can see some successes. And this new nature of peacekeeping, which I mentioned, uh, we don't know if it, will, if it will succeed, for instance, the DRC, which I mentioned, but it's the right way of trying to do it, at least, I see. But the whole UN activity is very, is very flexible, it's, it's very multifunctional and geared towards the prevention of conflict and development. Mr. Peter, do you have any comment well, on that? Um, the question you raised is actually what I'm struggling with, with every day. So what can we do to try to, to prevent crisis and... and, and Sorry. Uh, I said that the question raised is, is a very good one. Uh, it's basically one we are struggling with every day. What I have found during my experience with the UN is that when we are in situations where big power interests are not at stake, it's much easier for us to do a good job and to be involved. 
and we're actually doing quite a few things that most probably none of you know about. And, and some, of, some of it you shouldn't even know about, at least not at this stage, which is a good thing. Uh, but as both Pierre and I have mentioned, there are certain things that we are doing that has, has actually been successful, but then there are also big failures. You know, in, in Rwanda, actually, there was a UN force uh, present, as you know, led by, by a Canadian military officer <laughs> before the outbreak of the genocide, but uh, the UN failed and the international community failed. So, and then, you know, we have the Srebrenica later on, also with the UN presence. We failed, and the international community failed. Why did we fail? Kofi Annan has uh, been asking himself these questions many, many times. And that's one of the reasons why he actually asked a few leading statesmen to come together and to try to ask a few critical questions. How can the UN be more effective? How can the UN be more effective also when there are big power interests at play that will make overall more difficult? And when it comes to Iraq, as you all will have noticed and that was mentioned, uh, even Bush is now sort of asking the UN to come in and Mr. Brahimi to find a political solution. I, on my side, will warn a little bit against that, because we at the UN, we do not have any magic answers. We cannot go in and save Iraq. We, we are not magicians. You know, there has to be a foundation at which we can build on. And that's why I tried in my intervention to ask a few critical questions of what are sort of the necessary preconditions if we are to go in to Iraq, let's say to build democracy. Is it really possible? Or have you already started the process that will actually lead in the wrong direction? I have no good answer to that. Of course, the UN as such is also the instrument. I mean, the UN is many different things. It's the Security Council, it's the General Assembly, it's the Secretariat. And of course, the Secretariat will do whatever the Security Council asks it to do. But we in the Secretariat still have a responsibility to ask critical questions and to ask the member states critical questions. What, what have impressed me is that, and I feel we are moving in the right directions. I think we see the challenges and we are much more capable of meeting those challenges now than we were 10 years ago. And that's why I perhaps uh, have a little bit more of optimism in me, in me than, than pessimism. I have a few Sorry. comments to the other things. We can do that later. Uh, over here, yes. <laughs> cooperation between Europe and the U.S. and that a gulf sounds like it's opened up between the two. Do we think that gulf is stabilized, or are we on a trajectory to keep growing farther and farther apart in the future? Well, actually, you might have some views on that, Mr. Peterson, just from the U.N. side. Yeah. Uh, I didn't really hear that clearly, but you asked if you thought we were go growing in different directions. Well, I, let me say that first of all, I, when, when we talk about Europe, I think it's uh, a simplification. Uh, I, I have noticed with great interest that when it comes to Europe, actually at all important for, foreign policy decisions, Europe is not united, it's divided. And that is not only Great Britain. But, uh, and it's not only old Europe versus new Europe. It's a, Europe is a very complex uh, political entity. And what you find is basically that what is defined as national interests is still what is, I believe, is sort of the defining element in their for, foreign policies. I, I do agree that there is both a, a problem of process, it's a problem of sort of selling uh, the US policy to Europe. But there is also a problem of perception. And what happened with the Bush administration was basically that there were so many decisions were being made. And I agree that there were, were a lack of process. But it was also that too many things were following after each other. So we sort of, Europe started to see this as a pattern, as a unilateral pattern. But then I actually believe that there would have been a difference if Mr. Clinton had still been a president. He would have been able to sell this in a very different way to the European public. I actually believe that selling 
the selling, the package would have been very, very different as well and would have made a difference. And that's why, even though it's correct that there is a structural problem, Europe is also, I mean, can also, you can also sell a policy to the European public, uh, which makes it easier for Europe to, to actually agree. So I'm actually not, I'm, when it comes to uh, the real dividing lines, I'm not really sure if it is between Europe and United States, or whether it's actually the dividing line is basically through Europe. And that's not to argue against what you have observed, that there are many, many differences in political culture and so on. But still, I actually believe that the dividing line is not between Europe and the United States, but between within the United, within uh, Europe. May I? Oh, oh sorry. May I just say that uh, when it comes to getting at the root causes, if we accept that, when it comes to so-called failed states, and then uh, I think there, Europe, UN, and also the United States are united in, um, perhaps not yet in the analysis with the Bush administration, I say not yet, I would say, but still, there we are united how it is important to combat poverty, to get development, trade, and so on. So th there I see no, no problem, really. And when it comes to uh, fighting terrorism, had we, if we just imagine that we had only had have uh, only <laughs> Afghanistan, I mean, there we went in, we were united, mm. and but we couldn't go kind of all the way because there was this distraction of Iraq, distraction of resources, of interest, of focus, and we are struggling now with Afghanistan. But we all are united there. Uh, still, we want to get at the root causes there to stabilize and develop and so on. And we are united with, with the U.S. in this. So Iraq was such a big distraction in many ways and, and scared so many people, also in Europe, of where, where we are going. I wonder if I could um, make a point about uh, uh, Secretary General Anand. When he was here several years ago, when we had our celebrations, 50th anniversary of United and so <laughs> forth, uh, he made a very passionate point here at Zellerbach that, and this comes closer, I think, to the failed state, rogue state situation, that the issues for the next century were not going to be Pache, China, and the U.S., uh, great power rivalries of the sort at the beginning of the 20th century. They were going to be the problems that population increase, uh, population explosion, um, resource depletion, health and uh, ecological uh, questions were going to create. Right? And that there were the grounds for concern about failed states. The rest would be epiphenomenal in a sense. Uh, I don't know whether we have lost our nerve in terms of looking at those very large issues. Right? And that perhaps looking at the issues of Europe versus the United States on the perception of where the risk is in categorization may be a, a diversion from that issue. I wonder whether anyone has any views on that. Steve? Yeah, can I, I, you know, I, I actually had no intention of, when I came up here this evening of speaking about the U.S.-European uh, gap. I do want to, I want to respond to this, underline something um, that Mr. Peterson said as well. Um, this fact that you've actually had a reduction in conflict is a very striking fact. And I, I think the data, this is from my colleagues, Furon and Leighton, um, is that um, the number of, I, I, the increase in the number of civil, civil wars have tended to last for a long time. Um, the increase over the last decade in new wars has not changed very much, but there has been a substantial increase in the number of wars that have been ended. And I think, you know, at least one place to look to that is to look to the UN, to look at peacekeeping operations. So it's actually been successful in a way that has not, I think as Mr. Peterson said, been acknowledged. And it's striking. And I think if we kind of, let's, you know, if we roll the world back to 910, and we're kind of looking at what has happened. I mean, we, you know, the Europeans would be cranky about Kyoto and the ICC. But these other kinds of processes in terms of intervention, I think, and, and peace, kind of peacekeeping, ending civil wars, would have actually, I think, gone on. And it's actually, it's an impressive accomplishment. And exactly as Mr. Peterson said, not a recognized one. 
I think the real problem here is next steps, and it speaks to what to do about these issues. We don't actually, first of all, we don't actually, you know, look, we don't know what we're doing in terms of developing better governance. You know, there's actually a negative correlation between the amount of foreign aid and economic performance in sub-Saharan Africa over the last 25 years, an inverse correlation. And it's fine, as I've said, to say that you need institutions to have economic development, but we don't really know how to do it. We don't know about sequencing. Um, we don't know where we can put our resources most effectively. We haven't coordinated between the U.S. and Europe, and I'm sure in these issues that once we actually try, what you're going to get is a reflection of, you know, we'll try to reproduce ourselves because that's what we always do. And while we, you know, both the Europeans and the Americans and the Japanese, for that matter, are very successful domestic political economies and political systems, they're not the same. So the issue of how you should actually, I think you can stabilize these environments in part because these places are so weak. I mean, what happened in Haiti? I mean, Aristide got pushed out by 200 guys with guns. I mean, there's nothing there. These places are empty shells. So with relatively modest commitments of resources, you actually can save a lot of lives and kind of stabilize a place. But how we move from there, and if you look at Bosnia, now we should not be here, the Europeans have put in a, you know, $60 billion, $5,000 per Bosnia or something, a huge amount of money, and the place is still a bunch of ethnic enclaves. And this is not to knock the Europeans. This stuff is hard, and we don't really know how to do it well. So I think, you know, if we actually, if we could somehow take terrorism off the table, which we're not going to be able to do, I think we could do with the kind, we could deal with the kind of conflict mediation, conflict prevention, and even intervention to prevent some of these conflicts moderately effectively, and we've actually done that. But thinking about addressing Dick's question about how you actually create better institutions, boy, I think we're, we're really at a loss. And I'm going to babble for one more second. Look at the debate between democracy on the one hand and the ideas that you need better governance. Mm -hmm. On the so other hand, the, totally the, unresolved. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, it's true that my colleague you know, and friend, Condi Rice, you know, talks about Germany and Japan. Well, you know, if you ask me, I think the best you know, if you're looking for an exemplary case, okay, I would say it's probably Korea, which was a very, very poor country in 1950, lower per capita income than Ghana. What's the Korean story? Civil war, American military occupation, huge number of American troops for 50 years, and 20 years of a military dictatorship before they became a democratic country. Now, maybe that's a better path. But it's not exactly a path that you can enunciate out loud in the United States and get a lot of resonance. So I just want to say we don't actually know how to do this. You know, to do this, and this being actually create effective institutions that can create security and well-being for people. Any other closing comments from the panel? Well, as you know, the concept or goal of the symposium is to promote the understanding of political, economic, and cultural issues. I think. This evening has certainly been a central example of how that happens. But it is also important to know that this is a collaboration over these years between the University of California, Berkeley, and the Norwegian and Swedish consulates general in San Francisco, who have been principal supporters of the possibility that we can bring groups like this together. So uh, not only do I want to thank the panel, of course, for their contributions, but Consul General Ari Norheim and Consul General Barbara Osher are the ones here who have made it possible for us to be together and meet this panel. So on our general behalf, I would like to thank you and your governments for this support. And of course, to have us all join in thanking our panel for these contributions. Thank you.